Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second episode of the Japan Business Podcast. My name is Eric Ahona. I'm your host and the founder of Japan Business Consulting. And today we're going to dive into how to navigate the Japanese market. Now, I want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. So, first of all, in the last episode, I gave you a bit of a backstory about myself. And I just want to touch on a brief introduction about who I am and why I am, I am doing what I'm doing with Japan Business Consulting. Then we're going to dive into understanding the Japanese market in general, some facts and figures. And then we're going to talk about what the most common challenges are to enter the Japanese market. After that, we're going to talk about how to navigate Japanese business culture. As you might already know, Japan is a country that has quite a unique business culture, and knowing some facts about the culture will be always an advantage. And last but not least, we're going to talk about strategies for market entry. Okay, let's get started. So, first of all, As you might already know if you listened to the first episode, I started my interest in Japanese culture mainly because of my pen pal back in the days that wrote me a letter in Japanese. In 1996 to 97, I spent one school year in Japan among Japanese students with minimal exposure to English, almost zero. And during that year, I became so proficient in Japanese that I started working for Japanese companies on trade shows in my hometown, Hanover, in Germany, after my return. In 2000, I went to college and started with international management and Japanese business as a major. And during that time, I went to Japan or back to Japan. For some internships in 2002 and 2003. So, those internships were with NTT Docomo, a, uh, a Japanese mobile phone carrier provider, and back then the inventor of emails on mobile phones when everybody was still texting and there was no iPhone. And、um, basically, Japan was the, at the forefront of mobile communication.、Um, After that, in 2005, I joined Komatsu Europe and、uh, was working between Europe, the US, and Japan,、um, helping negotiations with a Japanese,、uh, sorry, with the US、uh, joint venture partner and、uh, also helped with supply chain and、uh, cost reduction activities in Europe between European, US, and Japanese suppliers. And in 2015, I moved to Miami, which had always been my dream, and founded Japan Business Consulting. Let's move on to understand the Japanese market. If you didn't know yet, Japan is the third largest economy and has、um, actually a lot of US、uh, imports, so it's the th- fourth largest importer of、uh, US, US products after.、Uh, Canada, Mexico, and China.、Uh, it has a economic stability which is not really known in other first world countries and、um, has an absence. So, for example, even if there is some downturn in other economies, like for example, the Lehman shock of 2008, 2009. Japan was still pretty stable. I still remember that my colleagues in Germany、um, had to take short time work, which meant they were staying at home. But I was working full time in Japan, so um, uh, the Japanese economy was doing relatively well. So the stability is、um, quite unique.、Um, there is an absence of corruption. You will Almost see no corruption in Japan, which is、uh, even in developed first world countries,、uh, sometimes can be an issue, but it's close to zero in Japan. There is an aging population, so the,、uh, 
uh, average lifespan in Japan is one of the highest in the world. And uh, this is something that you might have to consider when doing business, business with Japan if you have anything in relation to technology to help an aging population, then Japan is certainly a great market for you. It has a large consumer market. So uh, among the almost 130 million people that are living in Japan, um, it has really a lot of uh, households and, and individuals with disposable income. So it has um, a good foundation if you're also selling a B2C product, not necessarily B2B, although we'll come and uh, talk about that as well. And it has world-class infrastructure. What does it mean? Just to give you a real-world example, um, if Amazon one-day delivery is something that is pretty obvious in most European countries or uh, even in some areas in the US, in Japan, it's not only same-day or one-day delivery, but they give you a time window to say when exactly you will receive your package. So between uh, 8 and 9 uh, or between, I don't know, 12 and, uh, sorry, 12 p.m. and uh, uh, 2 p.m. So the infrastructure is really well developed in terms of logistics as well as in terms of transportation. For example, you can go all the way from the north of um, Japan to the south tip uh, without delay. You will be on time knowing exactly when you will arrive. Usually trains have uh, a above 90% uh, punctuality rate in Japan. So this is something to keep in mind in terms of uh, logistics. The infrastructure is second to none, but people in Japan, Japanese consumers already take this as granted and expect you to deliver in time once you make a promised delivery date. Now, what are the most common challenges of market entry? Obviously, the culture is very different um, and maybe the biggest barrier is the language barrier. Um, but nowadays, there are some options on um, how to facilitate that. There are obviously interpreters that you can work with. There are um, uh, people on... Um, platforms like Fiverr or uh, Upwork that can help you with your Japan activities. But usually the, mo the biggest pain point that I see most of my clients mention is that it is uh, an issue in regards to how to um, do business in regards to um, making a decision. So many decisions are not made during meetings in Japan, but outside of meetings. And uh, a lot of my clients find that very frustrating. And obviously there are the language barriers that even if your Japanese counterpart does speak some English, it is usually uh, not easy to communicate. There is also a complex regulatory environment. Uh, Japanese uh, has a lot, or like the Japanese market has a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of um, norms that you have ful to fulfill, standards, testing, and so on, before you can actually sell your product. Um, but uh, this is a, a necessary obstacle that you need to take to be successful long-term. There's intense competition, so whatever you might sell, uh, more likely than not, it's already sold in Japan and you already have some kind of competition. Um, as mentioned, it has a large consumer market and uh, people are thirsty for innovation and um, useful products and whatever uh, you have to offer. So it's, uh, it's a uh, in truly intense competition. Um, if uh, you have not done your homework and some market research, uh, it is uh, very difficult to enter the Japanese market. There are high operating costs. The labor cost is comparable, comparable to um, uh, the United States and uh, uh, some countries in Europe, but also the uh, cost for real estate or rental cost or warehouse cost is uh, quite high 
So um, this is something that you have to take, take into consideration. And also the um, uh, great infrastructure and the great logistics that I've priorly mentioned uh, is something that uh, you have to take into consideration that the operating costs might be a bit higher than in other markets. But it depends. There are always ways for cost reduction. Then distribution challenges are the ones that I mentioned. You really have to work with a good distribution partner to fulfill the things that Japanese consumers already take as granted, as mentioned, not only one day or same day delivery, but to have, to have delivery in a certain uh, time slot. And then there are unique consumer preferences. Um, you usually cannot just uh, put a label on your product that is in Japanese and then sell it. Sometimes you need to customize or localize your product or its marketing uh, and its branding uh, since uh, Japan is a unique market and they value a lot if they see that a product has been adjusted for their needs or for their uh, cultural differences or for their market specifically. Now let's move on to the last slide. Oh, sorry, not last. Um, uh, we still talk about Japanese business culture. So the emphasis when doing business in Japan is to have respect for your business partner and the hierarchy. So you always address the person that is highest in the hierarchy. And um, if you are, especially if you are part of the Japanese company, you uh, usually don't talk a lot during a meeting, except you've been asked by the uh, person higher in the hierarchy. And um, this is a form to show respect. So you only are um, talking if you're asked to talk. This, of course, if you are like on the uh, Western, uh, in the Western business party that is um, working with a Japanese partner, uh, that is a bit different, but it's always good to have a certain amount of respect and to um, also respect the, the hierarchy. Uh, in a Japanese um, uh, partner that you're working, working with. Now you always have also have to consider that consensus and harmony are really important in Japan. That means that there will not be or rarely a decision will be made just by one person. Usually it's an internal meeting where everybody tries to to find a uh, group solution to a problem or to make a group decision. So this is how um, most decisions are made in Japan. They try to find a consensus and to do that in harmony. It is usually not the way to just do individual, like that an individual does a, uh, a decision um, for whatever business decision has to be done. Of course, the relationships and trust, I think this is something that is internationally um, uh, accepted or all um, uh, businesses are trying to um, uh, create relationships with their business partners and trust. But in Japan, it is, I would say, even more intense. Because to give you an example, if there was some kind of business, um, let's say, like a lack of trust because of some business issue. This will not only stay with a person that has experienced this trust, but it will stay for decades and maybe even generations of employees for that company uh, and even longer. Because um, once you fail to establish trust or once you fail in the eye of a um, uh, company, the likelihood of working together again is uh, very, very, very low. That's why to establish a relationship, maintain the relationship and to invest into trust building activities is, I would say, even more important than when doing business with other uh, non-Japanese or Western companies. 
communication and business etiquette is also something that um, you have to take into consideration. So in communication regards, Japanese communicate a lot non-verbally and uh, you might have to uh, adjust to that a little bit in the beginning because um, it's such a homogenous culture or such a homogenous um, society or country that sometimes talking too much is not or talking is not seen as valuable as being silent and observing. So sometimes uh, saying less is more valuable than, than saying too much. And then the business etiquette is, of course, you have the bow and uh, you have the, the small present that you usually have to bring um, uh, to a um, business partner. Uh, nothing too fancy, but uh, maybe some local sweets or something like that to show that you appreciate them. And uh, then, of course, when you sit in a meeting room, there's a certain order to sit in. Um, usually, as a guest, you sit closer towards the door. But um, with the most important person at the middle chair of the table uh, and then the, other, the others around him. So and then the Japanese counterpart will sit also the most important person was, will sit in the middle of the table. Um, so this is something very unique to um, learn about. I'll dive into this later on in other episodes. Then innovation and quality. Japanese love innovation. If it's very pr practical, they are very traditional, but also are interested in and open towards new technology and innovation. Uh, if it embraces and uh, respects traditional Japanese norms, cultures, and so on. Um, and quality, this is a point I think Japan is known for having a, um, a really like outstanding quality, and be it in, in the manufacturing industry or, or other industries as well. So uh, keep in mind that Japanese uh, um, expect quality from your product or service as well if it is sold in Japan. Now last but not least, what are the strategies for market entry? Of course you can start with e-commerce, like an e-commerce uh, shop to test if your product is um, has a proof of concept in, on the Japanese market. That's always a relatively budget-friendly way to start. You can start exporting through a distributor or a sales agent. Um, where the distributor does uh, the logistics and the marketing activities and um, uh, the sales. And um, this is usually a pretty common uh, way of market entry for the majority of the, the uh, companies I'm working with. Then there's also licensing or franchising. So if you want to li license out your product or, or service, or you, want, you already have a franchise and you want to expand to Japan, that's always an, an option. There are many uh, successful licensing and franchising ex uh, uh, examples in Japan. Uh, it does work, but you always have to adjust slightly, as shown in the slide before, to Japanese uh, market needs and market demands. Uh, then obviously a joint venture in the strategic, strategic alliance. This uh, has been more complicated in the past. There have been many uh, joint ventures and strategic alliances with US or European companies that were not successful. But um, like, for example, uh, if you remember um, uh, Daimler Benz, uh, sorry, uh, Daimler Chrysler with Mitsubishi, they purchased Mitsubishi, but that didn't go well in Japan for them. Um, so, but that is something that I will dive into on another episode. And of course, last but not least, you can also start a, a Japanese subsidiary, but this is something that um, uh, obviously you need some experience um, with and uh, absolutely some guidance, some consultants you're working with uh, or working, for example, with a Japan external trade organization and short JETRO that also help you to find uh, usually free of charge office space to start your Japanese subsidiary um, or just to do some, some market research. So those are the strategies of market entry. That was a bit about how to navigate the Japanese market. I hope you found that valuable 
And uh, please let me know in the comments below what you thought and what you would like to hear more about. And uh, feel free to reach out on social media and on the website. And until next time, this is Eric signing out. Arigato gozaimasu.